Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. I'm hanging out here in the woods and today I've got a bit of a different video for you. So rather than taking you around these woods and introducing you to some plants and trees and mushrooms, which is what I typically do, I'm going to instead showcase a mycologist who currently lives in Oakland, California and who's doing some really great things for the mycological culture and community here in North America. His name is Alan Rockefeller and I first heard of Alan many years ago when I would browse a website called The Shroomery and I would see Alan's name pop up on what seemed like every other post in the forum. And if you're on Facebook, and especially if you're a member of any one of the thousands of Mushroom Facebook groups, then you've probably seen Alan Rockefeller's name pop up from time to time, either because he's answering questions or because he's posting photographs of mushrooms that he found or because people are just talking about him. Now I had the good fortune of recently meeting Alan during an event that he was leading in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. And New Cumberland is located in southern Pennsylvania, just a bit south of Harrisburg, the state capital. Personally, I had never been to New Cumberland prior to meeting Alan, but based on the six hours or so that I spent within the city limits, I thought it was a pretty neat town. It was certainly a beautiful day, there was no snow on the ground, which is somewhat atypical for early February in Pennsylvania, and the sun was shining. Now it's interesting because many people assume that I don't need to attend these kinds of events because I already know a lot about mushrooms. Well first, that's definitely not true. There are way more things that I do not know about mushrooms than what I do know. And second, as part of my learning process, I am a huge fan of attending classes, events, workshops, and walks. Now a lot of people ask me, Adam, how do you learn this information? And that's exactly what I tell them. Attend classes, attend events, attend workshops, and attend walks. Books are great, websites are great, online forums and groups are great, but there is no substitute for learning in person from people who know more than you do. By attending these events, you not only gain access to the instructors, but you're surrounding yourself with a community of like-minded individuals who have similar goals and want to achieve similar results. So that's why I attended this class with Alan Rockefeller. I knew it would be great to hang out with him. I knew it would be great to interview him and I knew it would be great to hang out with other people who are just as interested and mildly obsessed with mushrooms as I am. Now the class was called Molecular Mycology and what we learned to do in this class was extract DNA from mushrooms and sequence them. So as participants, we were encouraged to bring mushrooms, dried or fresh, to the class for use in sequencing. And I brought four different specimens myself to the class and I learned how to do all of that. Now not only was Alan Rockefeller an instructor, but William Padilla Brown was another instructor for this event. And some of you are probably familiar with his work in cultivating cordyceps mushrooms with his company Myco Symbiotics, or perhaps you watched him on the big screen because he was recently featured in the film Fantastic Fungi. Now Alan Rockefeller, he's a fascinating guy. He's from Chicago. He's the son of two high school teachers, which is probably from where he gets his knack for teaching. He currently lives in Oakland, California, and he does a lot of work with counterculture labs in Oakland. So because he lives on the other side of the continent, first I wondered what he thought of Pennsylvania. Luckily he picked a good time to visit because temperatures were in the 50s, there was no snow on the ground, and there was plenty of sunshine. So I wanted to get his initial thoughts on Pennsylvania. It's pretty nice. I haven't been here for like 30 years, so it's, um, it's pretty cool here. The, you know, People are pretty nice, a lot of mushrooms. And he's right. People are pretty nice here in Pennsylvania, and we do have a lot of mushrooms. Now, Alan just doesn't spend most of his time in California. He travels a lot all over North America, and he spends a disproportionate amount of time in Mexico, sometimes half the year studying mushrooms in Mexico. So naturally, I had to ask him, why Mexico? Why hunt mushrooms specifically in Mexico? I mean, the United States does have a lot of mushroom diversity. I am told that South America has a lot of mushrooms. A lot of mycologists spend time in New Zealand hunting mushrooms. People even hunt mushrooms in the Arctic. So I was really curious about his particular choice of Mexico, and perhaps not too surprisingly, Alan was quick to rattle off a couple of good reasons. A few things. One of them is that the Mexican season is the exact opposite of the California season. So by traveling between California and Mexico, I can hunt mushrooms all year round. And also Mexico is close enough that it's not completely foreign like it would be in a different continent. You know, this, it's still pretty familiar, but it's different enough that uh, it's really interesting. And also the people in Mexico are super nice. The food is really good. And it's not that far. I can just drive there in a couple days. 
And, you know, I just started going to Mexico and you know, ended up like, you know, I could do a good job of California and Mexico or a bad job of studying mushrooms in the whole world. Now, Alan also told me that almost every weekend in Mexico, at least during peak mushroom season, there's a mushroom fair. And that seems ideal to me. So lots of mushrooms, lots of nice people interested in mushrooms, lots of mushroom fairs, all good reasons to spend time in Mexico. Alan also started to talk a little about the differences between the ecologies of California and Mexico and how these differences correlate to the kinds and diversity of fungi found in the two areas. You know, in California, you go mushroom hunting and you'll, if you hunt every day for a month, you'll find maybe one really good thing that makes you say, wow, this is really unique. Whereas in Mexico, you find at least two things a day that you're just like, wow, this is really cool. So the diversity of mushrooms in Mexico is much higher and that's because the mushroom diversity follows the plant diversity. Like in California, we have maybe a dozen species of oaks. In Mexico, there's over 150. And the pine diversity is the same way, so the mushroom diversity follows that. And that all makes sense. And I'll bet that's at least partly why Pennsylvania is such a great state for fungi. One of the reasons being the diversity of oaks found within this state. I think we have around 19 or so species of oak that are native to the state and another seven that are hybrids. So plant diversity directly correlates with fungal diversity. Now, when Alan's not living and working in Oakland, California, and when he's not studying mushrooms in Mexico, he can often be found traveling around the United States leading classes and workshops. And that's what brought him to Pennsylvania, and that's what brought me to New Cumberland to meet him. He was leading a class with William Padilla Brown on a technique called PCR. Now those three letters, PCR, can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But to Alan, and to biologists, and to mycologists around the world, PCR means something very specific. Polymerase chain reaction. It sounds complex, but Alan has a way of breaking down complex topics and explaining them in ways that are easy to comprehend. So what is PCR and what are some of its practical applications in the field of mycology? It's a way to sequence mushrooms and read the DNA so you can discover how organisms are actually related. It was really good for mushroom identification and also to figure out where your mushroom fits in with the whole tree of life and you know, discovering new species and just like you know, learning more and digging in deeper into what the things you find in nature are. So usually I sequence stuff because I would have taken a really nice picture of it and maybe it's something really rare or maybe it's something I just found a whole lot of and got a real nice picture and then I want to know what name that I should put on this picture. So sequencing is for that reason usually, but also I uploaded all the sequences to GenBank. So then, you know, if someone sequences this next year and 10 years and a thousand years, they'll say, oh, Alan found this thing in Mexico, you know, and then they'll be able to, it always links to my photos so they can see the photos and all that kind of stuff. So clearly one outcome of PCR is figuring out the name of a mushroom. And if there is no match in a sequencing database, then perhaps a new species has been discovered. And all this talk about PCR really got me thinking about the incessant drive and motivation to know the identity of a wild organism. There's this obsession, not just in the mycological community, but in other communities as well, with needing to know the name of a wild organism. And I get it because I think I have this obsession as well, mostly with plants, mushrooms, and trees, but I'd love to know the name of every wild organism here in Pennsylvania if I could. So I had to ask Alan about this obsession and if it was ever okay for him to not know the name of something. So I asked him, do you ever come across something that you haven't seen before? Maybe you know its family, maybe you know the genus, but you don't know the species. And do you ever think to yourself, it's fine, I don't need to know what that thing is. I'm perfectly content to walk through these woods, not quite sure what I just saw. And Alan had a great answer for me, and it's one that stems back to his early days hunting mushrooms 20 years ago. You know, I kind of got into mushroom identification because I went hiking in 2001 and there was mushrooms everywhere and I thought, geez, there must be people out there that know what these things are and could put names on them. I didn't know who any of those people were or how to find them, but I just decided I wanted to be one of those people. So I started taking pictures and, and studying mushroom identification. And after a few years, you know, I got it figured out. But when I see something, if I don't know what it is, I'll definitely collect it. The only things that are okay to leave in the forest and not collect are the things that I already know exactly what it is. Usually because I've sequenced it or someone that I trust has sequenced it and we know exactly what it is. But if there's no sequences in GenBank or it's a total mystery, then I'll definitely pay attention to it. And that's what I thought. The drive and the motivation to know the name of something so seemingly simple yet so bewildering, like a wild mushroom, runs deep. 
with me, with Alan, with many other people, and perhaps with you too. Now, Alan's been at this for a while, not only as a mushroom enthusiast, but as a teacher. He's incredibly generous with his time, both online and in person. And because he's been involved in the mushroom community for the past 20 years, I had to know how things have changed in the mushroom community over the past 20 years. And I had to know because I haven't been involved in this community for all that long, and I'm always curious to hear what the veteran mushroom hunters and mycologists have to say about how things have changed since they first got into it. So I asked Alan if he's noticed any changes over the years. You know, when I first started in 2001, it was real obscure, and the only people that would go to these mushroom events were the people that were really into, you know, wild foods and stuff like that. And probably just the past five years, all of a sudden, you know, a lot of people you know, and have gotten into it. And a lot of it is due to the medicinal mushrooms, and a lot of it is due to the popularity of foraging, and then even more is due to the popularity of psilocybin. So kind of all these things come together just to make mushrooms really popular, and I think it's certainly a good time to be into mushrooms. For sure. Now is certainly a good time to be into mushrooms. And I also wanted to ask Alan, what has this whole thing done for him? You know, many people who are interested in mushrooms have quite a few favorable things to say regarding the impacts that hunting and studying and ingesting mushrooms have had on them. And so I wanted to know, since getting involved in all this, how has Alan's life changed? And not only that, what can all of this do for other people as well? Really just getting people into nature is a really important thing to do. So I think this whole mushroom thing will get people more connected with nature and get them more interested in nature, get more people really nerding out and identifying whatever they can see, whether it's a plant or a mushroom or a tree. You know, I think it kind of speaks to a very primal part of our psyche that we're like, we just really like to be outside. And when I started hiking, I liked to spend a lot of time outside, but I kind of felt like I was wasting my time outside. And I was like, you know, I was like, we'd go to the forest and kind of be like, what the hell am I doing with my day? Like, it's pretty sure, but what am I doing out here? So when I got into mushrooms, it gave me a real reason to go to the forest and I think more people will get you know will go out to the woods with a purpose and that's like it's almost like Pokemon Go where you're looking for a certain Pokemon except that you're looking for the rare plants or you're looking for the best example of something that's not rare and I think that'll get more popular and people will just uh, learn more and more about the nature around them and if you thought Alan Rockefeller was only just about the mushrooms think again as a final question, I asked Alan to entertain a particular thought experiment, and I wanted to know if for some reason, in some hypothetical, though highly unrealistic scenario, if he couldn't do anything with mushrooms. He couldn't work with mushrooms, couldn't study mushrooms, couldn't hunt mushrooms, couldn't teach others about mushrooms. Like, mushrooms are completely gone from the picture for some reason. What would he do instead? You know, I like electronics and taking electronics apart and figuring out how they work and hacking them to do different things. So it'd probably be something like that. You know, before I was into mushrooms, I had a you know, big electronics lab and just a lot of soldering and stuff like that. So there you have it, Alan Rockefeller, mycologist extraordinaire with a deep love for fungi, for Mexico, for PCR, for electronics, for teaching, and for getting other people inspired to head into their woods or their local parks or even into their backyards to interact with nature in a more intimate way. To look more closely, to be patient, to take photographs, to upload those photographs online, to become nature fanatics in the quest toward understanding who these organisms are, the plants, the mushrooms, the trees, and learning valuable lessons through study, through observation, and through appreciation. I want to thank Alan Rockefeller for giving me the opportunity to interview him and to take his class. And I want to thank William Padilla Brown for hosting this class in Pennsylvania. And I encourage all of you to check out their work online and in person. And as I mentioned earlier, I encourage all of you to attend classes, events, workshops, and walks to learn from people who love to inspire and to teach because I truly feel that there is no substitute for this kind of interaction between teacher and student especially when it comes to learning nature skills. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you on the next one.